It's America's favorite chocolate bar. It's certainly my chocolate bar, but to a great many people from other parts of the world, the Hershey bar tastes like vomit. Not figurative vomit, but literal, actual human sick. My wife Lauren knows what I'm talking about. When I was in college, I worked at this camp in Pennsylvania, and we took the kids to Hershey Park. And my co-counselor, who is from New Zealand, was very excited. She tried a Hershey Kiss and promptly said, Oh my God, this tastes like vomit. And then she made us all eat Cadbury. <laughs> I talked about the Hershey bar recently on my TikTok and look at all of these comments from people not in the US. And it's not just the Hershey bar. Hershey's has been so dominant in the US market for so long that most other big chocolate brands here have to imitate that Hershey taste to some extent. This is just what American consumers expect chocolate to taste like, but why? Well, the history and science that explains this is pretty interesting and it raises some profound found questions about how we define the quality of food. Is there such a thing as objectively good or bad food? Especially when it comes to something like a dessert, the sole function of which is to provide us with pleasure. The reason this tastes like puke to some people and this doesn't probably has to do with the milk, so we first have to understand how milk got into chocolate in the first place. For virtually all of its 4,000 year history, chocolate has been a beverage. Ancient Mesoamericans harvested cacao beans and did various things to combine them with water into a drink with medicinal and ceremonial purposes. This may have included fermenting the cacao to make alcohol. Europeans got chocolate by way of the Aztecs, whom the Spanish conquered in the 16th century. The Spaniards used it as a medicine too, which makes sense because unsweetened cocoa totally tastes like medicine. It is crazy bitter, but as the song goes, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. And once somebody at the Spanish court got the bright idea to try that, Europeans started drinking chocolate for pleasure. And at some point, they also started pouring milk into their water-based cocoa drink, the same way that people pour it into coffee. It smooths and thickens the texture and it rounds off the bitter flavors. It wasn't until the 19th century that European confectioners started playing with solid chocolate products, consisting of cocoa powder, known as cocoa solids, cocoa fat, known as cocoa butter, and sugar, and eventually milk, for the same reason they put it in the drink. This was probably particularly advantageous for early solid chocolates, which were produced by relatively crude means. We love a milk-free dark chocolate these days, but the original dark chocolate was often described as gritty and harsh. Adding milk helped. Contrary to what the Cadbury marketing illustrations would have you believe, you can't pour milk into solid chocolate. Milk is mostly water, which doesn't mix with fat, and confections with high water content are hospitable to microbial life. They can mold if you don't eat them within a few days. The Nestle company was born in Switzerland when Henri Nestle figured out a process to create dehydrated milk, powdered milk. Nestle's neighbor, Daniel Peter, added the powdered milk to his solid chocolate mix, and the rest is history. Up in England, Cadbury's first solid milk chocolate also used powdered milk, but chocolatiers quickly figured out that you could make an even smoother, tastier product if you used condensed milk rather than powdered milk. That is, milk that has had a lot of its water boiled out, but it's still a liquid. Over in the United States, an already wealthy and successful caramel maker named Milton Hershey was trying to develop his own milk chocolate process. Much of what I'm about to tell you is drawn from the journalist Michael D'Antonio's excellent biography of Hershey. In 1903, Hershey retreated to his old family homestead in Pennsylvania and started experimenting with milk. The first thing they landed on was using skim milk, milk that has had the fat removed. Milk fat would go rancid in the chocolate after a while, and that was not going to work for the kind of shelf-stable, mass-produced product that Hershey envisioned. He cooked batch after batch of milk in a giant copper vacuum pan. When you cook a liquid in a vacuum, that lowers its boiling point so you can drive off the water at much lower temperatures. He still couldn't get a product that he was happy with, and in desperation one day, Hershey summoned one of his factory workers named John Schmalbach. Schmalbach tried mixing the skim milk with sugar, and then he cooked it on the vacuum pan at a very, very low temperature for a long time. And then when it was done cooking, he turned off the heat and then just let it sit there and cool in the vacuum for a long time. Then they opened up the pan and Hershey said, look at that beautiful batch of milk. 
How come you didn't burn it? You didn't go to college. Out of context, that remark sounds way more rude than it probably actually was, because just before this, Hershey had indeed invited a fancy college chemist to his lab to try to make a batch of milk, and the chemist did in fact burn that batch of milk. But anyway, Hershey and his guys made a batch of chocolate with Schmalbach's milk, and he thought it was perfect. The chocolate had a snap to it, like al dente pasta. It was smooth, it was shelf-stable, and it was better suited to mass production. Condensed milk, you can flow through systems of pipes. You can't do that with powdered milk. It may indeed have tasted a little like sick, we'll talk about why in a second, but Hershey had found a money-saving product and process. And you can save even more money on your groceries today with Fetch Rewards, the sponsor of this video, whom I'll now briefly thank. Fetch is an incredibly easy way to convert your grocery shopping into savings on like almost any product you could think of. Here's how it works. You just hit my link in the description and download the app. Then, whenever you go grocery shopping, you scan your receipt with your phone. It's really easy. The app tells you exactly what to do. You just follow the directions. Even easier is uploading e-receipts. That works for all kinds of online shopping, not just groceries. It scans your email for eligible receipts and then converts them into points. Points you can use on a million things. The app shows you restaurants, Apple iTunes or Google Play, clothes, electronics, anything on Amazon. You send them your receipts, they send you points to save money. It's as simple as that. And you can get started right now with 2,000 points from me if you follow my link in the description and enter my code REGUSIA when you scan your first receipt. That's all down in the description. Thank you, Fetch. Now, back to vomit chocolate. The thing about the low temperature reduction process that John Schmalbach had invented for Hershey is that it soured the milk. Hershey's recipe is of course a closely guarded trade secret, but chocolate experts these days are generally in agreement that the sour taste in Hershey's is butyric acid, butter acid. They create it by lipolyzing or breaking down the fat content in the milk. And butyric acid may very well have been what made that 1903 batch of milk taste sour too. One way to make butyric acid is through anaerobic fermentation. Remember, they were doing it in a vacuum pan, anaerobic. Butyric acid is also created in our digestive systems, and in the event that the contents of our digestive systems leave, we are then exposed to that signature twang, that smell, that taste of butyric acid. This is probably why people who didn't grow up eating this stuff think this tastes like sick. For me, who did grow up eating this stuff, it's very different, because I've eaten Hershey's chocolate way more often than I've thrown up, thankfully. Therefore, to me, butyric acid tastes like chocolate, not sick. And when I go to the British import section of my local grocery store and pick up some goodies, damn, no Aero bars today, I am usually struck by how this chocolate tastes flat to me, dull. It lacks the acidity that I've been conditioned to expect. And British chocolate in particular tends to taste kind of fatty to me. Indeed, Cadbury uses vegetable oils in addition to cocoa butter. That may contribute to the smoother, creamier texture Cadbury has relative to Hershey's, but that could be a lot of things. The churning, the tempering, lots of things. Certainly Cadbury lovers really value the comparatively creamy texture. I should acknowledge that this particular bar is the American version of the Cadbury dairy milk, which is ironically distributed and partially manufactured by Hershey's, and the recipe has been adjusted a bit for the US market. It has no vegetable oil in it because that's not legally allowed in a U.S. product that's labeled as chocolate. It still tastes very different from a Hershey bar. Hershey haters often describe the texture of this as waxy by comparison to this, but you know what? I kind of like that. Cocoa butter goes very waxy when you get it cold, as anyone who's had chocolate chip ice cream can tell you, and I keep my chocolate bars in the fridge. I love that snap of waxy cocoa butter. In 2015, the BBC did a fun little focus group to analyze the difference between Hershey's and Cadbury, and that strikes me as a fair comparison. They're both inexpensive, mass-produced, mass-market chocolates. It would be absurd to put a Hershey bar up against a fine, handcrafted European chocolate. The adult focus groups preferred Cadbury. They described the Hershey's as harder, more bitter, not as rich. Interestingly, though, when the Beeb asked British kids which chocolate they liked, the kids were more likely to choose the Hershey bar. I think this one's better. 
Now, some of you are probably thinking right now, of course the kids like the Hershey bar better. The Hershey bar's got way more sugar. Not really, though. The BBC investigation found that widespread belief is chiefly the result of different labeling regulations in the UK versus the US. Cadbury and Hershey have about the same proportion of sugar. It's just that milk comes higher on the Cadbury ingredients list because the Brits rank the milk based on its liquid weight, not its evaporated weight. It may indeed be the case that the Hershey bar has proportionally less cocoa in it. If you look at the US and EU regulations on the minimum cocoa content of chocolate, it looks like the EU standard is higher. Yes, the UK isn't a member of the EU anymore, but they're still generally operating under those old rules. The EU standard for the minimum cocoa content of milk chocolate is higher, but the European standard is for dry cocoa solids, whereas the US standard is for chocolate liquor, which is a wet product. So these are probably apples and oranges numbers. I don't really know how to interpret this. I do know that a Hershey spokesman told the BBC that Hershey's contains 30% cocoa solids. If true, that'd be higher than the 23% that Cadbury claims for their own product. Though he's probably talking about the UK version of the Hershey bar, which is a slightly different recipe. But it's certainly the case that a Hershey bar has way less cocoa in it than a fine European dark chocolate bar. I mean, just look at it. Cocoa is very expensive and it's got a very intense flavor. Both of those things are bad for mass market chocolates. So if this doesn't have much cocoa in it, does that mean that the Hershey bar is an objectively inferior product? Certainly a lot of people People on my TikTok tried to make that argument. Cocoa is the defining ingredient of chocolate, so chocolate with less cocoa is objectively lesser chocolate, because it's less chocolate. Interesting argument. Certainly you would reach a point where the proportion of the cocoa was so low that the product would be utterly unrecognizable as chocolate. And some might argue that this has gone well below that point. But what if we extended that logic in the opposite direction? This logic implies that the finest chocolate bar in the world is the one that has the highest proportion of cocoa. And you know what? I happen to have some of that right here. It's called unsweetened baking chocolate. You ever just eaten some of this? Yeah, eat that and you will be immediately reminded why people started putting other stuff in their chocolate. You could argue that alcohol is the defining ingredient of a spirit, right? And if we apply our chocolate logic to booze, that means that pure ethanol is a superior beverage to fine scotch whiskey, which has all kinds of other things in it besides ethanol. And wine has even less alcohol in it than whiskey. Does that mean that whiskey is objectively superior to wine? Okay, now you might say, forget the cocoa percentages. Hershey bars are objectively bad because they taste like human vomit. We are evolved to find certain tastes and smells repulsive because they are indicative of substances that are dangerous to us. We are evolved to be repulsed by butyric acid and therefore a food that contains butyric acid is a violation of natural law. Well, I happen to be a fan of violating what a lot of people regard as natural laws. And a lot of the world's great foods are great because they ride the line between enticement and revulsion. Europeans generally love fermented milk products. Think of all the stinky cheeses they dig. And guess what? Parmesan has butyric acid in it too. Certainly you could argue that food can be objectively bad from a nourishment perspective, but even that would depend on the subjective dietary needs of the individual. And that whole line of inquiry is moot when it comes to a dessert, when it comes to candy that has no nutritional purpose. It's purely for pleasure. And I derive a lot of pleasure from eating this, not the least because I grew up with it. Candy more than anything else is wrapped up in childhood memory, right? I grew up in central Pennsylvania, not far from where Milton Hershey lived. There's an amusement park there now called Hershey Park. Every summer, my parents would take me there to ride the roller coasters, and on the way out, they would buy me a giant novelty Hershey Kiss, and I would slowly nibble away on that all summer long. Those warm feelings are half of what I'm tasting when I'm tasting this. And I bet that you could think of a food that you could eat that would take you right back to a very happy place in your life. In my moral code, anything that brings you pleasure is great, so long as it doesn't come at the potential particular expense of anybody else or at the particular expense of your long-term pleasure experiencing capacity. So take your pleasure where you find it. I'll do the same.